All right, guys, let's get started. Um, there is my website, joeyjohnsondo.com. Please feel free also to contact me through my website. If you get on there and leave a comment, then they do not go public. I have to review them all before they go public. So therefore, just, you know, indicate in there that you, you know, hey, you just contact me, that's fine. I don't typically put those public anyway on my website. So just wanted to throw that out there. Also, something else I'd like to throw out there is that three dollars is all I ask for a one-time only donation for anyone who's viewing these videos. Doesn't matter if you watch all of them 25,000 times, just one time three dollar donation is all I'm asking if you can afford it. Thanks a lot. So now, atypical bacteria. Okay, when we start talking about these, all right, we're going to start getting into some extracellular versus intracellular stuff, okay? So let's just draw a line right here, demarcate that. Let's look at the extracellulars first, okay? You're going to have the micro extracellulars. Then you're going to get down here to the spiral keys, which is going to be your bigs and your littles. Okay. And so something that you can do is when you think little, the L for leptospira, and then a T for trypanema pallidum. Okay. And so Borrelia B for big and mycoplasma M for myco. Okay. Now, if you remember, mycobacterium was one of your really cold. Okay, when it's my, it's really cold, so it's really cold. All those are going to be intracellular, okay? So just remember, my, it's really cold and chilly because I think I went ahead and put cox, uh, coxiella in it when I gave it in the first lecture, and you can do that also, or you can just say my, it's really cold. Coxiella is uh, something that causes Q fever, and you get that from livestock and farms. That might be worth your time to look up. However, we will not cover that one here, but I would say, Go ahead and on your spare time, check out Coxiella as well. All right, so extracellulars, mycoplasma. Okay, the thing about mycoplasma, if you remember, I said it had a fried egg appearance, and the big thing about it is that you are going to have the um, same symptoms of pneumonia here. However, the thing about this one is you will not have a productive cough. So you have someone that comes in, they're walking around, they're fine, x-ray looks horrible, they've got infiltrates everywhere, and you're like, what's going on? They have barely a low-grade fever and a non-productive cough. Start thinking mycoplasma, okay? They are cold agglutinogen positive. Also, um, like I said, they'll have a low-grade fever. You'll get cervical adenopathy. Most patients are going to be younger than 30 that have this. You'll see many neutrophils. There's an insidious onset, so many, many infiltrates, interstitial infiltrates will come in. And like I said, IgM, cold agglutinin. Remember, cold agglutinin is going to be your IgMs. Okay, mm, it's cold. And you might get an earache with this. Um, it can cause erythema of the pharynx. I have not really seen that come up a lot, but it can do that. You're going to have scattered crackles, though, when you're listening on your lungs to this one. This is community acquired pneumonia, it's atypical pneumonia. And you'll have a lot of dry hacking with this one. Like I said, it's going to be a non-productive cough. Um, you have, uh, you could have arthralgia with it, and I think that's probably about it for myco that we have to go over. So let's go on over here to Borrelia. All right, Borrelia burgdorferi, burgdorferi. Okay, so that's going to be known as your Lyme disease. And so what I like to say is I XO XO Lyme burgers because it is caused by the Zodis tick, okay? We'll see later on the uh, the Andersoni tick. That is going to be the one, once we start getting into viruses, I'll tell you now, it causes Rocky Mountain spotted, spotted fever, fever, excuse me, right over here. And so I'll go ahead and put that D Andersoni. And then you're gonna have the Lone Star tick, which is gonna cause ehrlichiosis once we start getting into the parasites. So those are your ticks right there that you definitely need to know. So the Zodis tick, um, you're gonna have silver staining to find Borrelia. Um, you can do dark field microscopy with any of these three right here. So whether it's Borrelia or Leptospira or Treponema pallidum, you can do dark field microscopy. Typically, that's going to be, though, with Treponema pallidum. So with Borrelia, um, let's see, what are going to be the big things about this one for Lyme disease? <clears throat> for Lyme disease, I would say to know um, that the deer and mouse tick is another name also for a Zodi's tick, sometimes called a black leg tick. You're going to find this mostly in the north. It can go Midwest as far as over as uh, Minnesota, typically up north, though, New York area, Maine, that kind of thing. 
And Lyme disease, you're going to get the erythema migraines. And if you remember, that's going to be your bullseye rash. So it's going to start here in the middle, and then it's going to start migrating out. You're going to have a clear spot right here. And then you're going to have one out there, so it looks like a bullseye. So that's the hallmark sign of it. You're going to have flu-like symptoms. It can also cause facial nerve palsy, and it can cause a cardiac arrhythmia. And at the third stage of it, so the first stage is going to be the flu symptoms and bullseye rash. Second stage is going to be facial nerve palsy and cardiac symptoms. Third stage will be your arthritis. And um, that's pretty much it. That's going to wrap that one up. Now for treponema pallidum, this one is syphilis. This is the one I was talking about with a painless canker. Okay, not a painful cankeroid like Ducari. Okay, so on this one, you can diagnose it with a VDRL or you can diagnose it with the FTA. BS test, okay, and so what I like to think of is fat abs, although the test is actually going to be FTA, it's going to be FTA, BS, but I just think, you know, you say you got fat abs, you know, or uh, let's say fat abs, you know, that's BS or something like that, just kind of get that in your head, and also you can diagnose it with the VDRL, but dark field microscopy is going to be your main go-to for treponema pallidum. Um, so you get a primary canker, then secondary, think S secondary for systemic, okay? And you're going to get that about three to six weeks post-infection. And the canker is absolutely gone, and it spontaneously clears up. And so now the thing has gone systemic. It gets widespread. You're going to get a maculopapular skin rash from the trunk to extremities, okay? So for syphilis, you know, say you have your body here, okay? And so it is going to go from your trunk out two extremities. That's the way that syphilis is going to move. So imagine the S is on your chest and it moves from the center there. I know center starts with a C, but work with me. And it goes out. At this stage, you can also get the condyloma lata. You can get the uh, uh, meningitis. And it can also go latent. If it's untreated, it'll go latent and then it pops back up in tertiary form. Now, once it pops back up in tertiary form, we've got problems, people, because now you're going to have something called tabes dorsalis. And that is going to be disruption of the spinal column, the dorsal spinal column, okay? And so then you're also going to have people at this stage that are going to have the gumas, which are the granulomas. You can have aortitis, and you'll have the, um, this is neurosyphilis at this stage, so it's affecting your nervous system, and you'll have the argyle Robertson pupil. Argyle Robertson pupil, if you've heard of it before, it was also known as prostitute's pupil, okay? So it's spelled Argyle Robertson. And the thing about it is that it can accommodate. Yes, it can accommodate, okay? But it cannot, all right, it can accommodate, but it cannot adjust properly when you shine light in it. And what this means is say you're looking at something, okay, you've got your eyes, so you hold up something close to this eye, right? Well, it can accommodate, okay? It can get big or it can get little, however. But the thing is, once you shine light into it, okay, there is not going to be any change at all, okay? So there's no reaction to light. It just stays the same. But if you hold something up to it, it can get big or little, depending on how close or far you take it away. So this is the prostitute's pupil, Argyle Robertson. Oh, yes, you can accommodate. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you shine light to it, it doesn't react, okay? Not like she's a vampire or something. So anyhow, so let's stick on syphilis for a little bit, okay? I like this. I like syphilis. Um, so with syphilis, the thing about it, also, is you're going to have the palmer rash. You're going to have it in the palm and also on the soles of your feet, okay? So if you see someone in a vignette or in real life that has a rash on the soles of their feet or a palmer rash or both or whatever, you're going to be thinking cars. Remember me talking like that? Syphilis It's going to be the, car, the S in that. Okay, you're going to have, uh-oh, sorry, an email there. You're going to have um, Coxsackie A virus or also you could have Rickettsia. Okay, those are your three if you see the rashes on the palms of the hands or on the soles of the feet. All right, you're going to diagnose this also um, with a rapid uh, uh, RPR, which is a rapid plasma regen test. Like I said, there, there are several different tests you can diagnose this with the fat abs, the VDRL, the rapid plasma regen, but the main thing you're going to see is dark field microscopy. All right. And um, I think that's all we're going to do on syphilis. Let's go on to the mycobacterium because mycobacterium is pretty hefty. All right. Yeah, mycobacterium. So things you can get from mycobacterium. Let's see. Where do we begin? Obviously, you can get leprosy, all right, because that's the leprae, or you can get TB. 
So we're just going to do that right here. Um, the avium right there. Now the thing about that is if you see any vignette and there is someone with AIDS and they have less than 50 CD4s, then you are going to pick avium pretty much. That's that's what I do and I have not gotten one wrong yet. Okay, so let's talk about TB. So you're going to have the primary infection with the GON complex. Okay, it's going to affect the upper segment of the lower lobes. The symptoms are insidious. You might have hemoptysis. You will have retrosternal pain that dorsally radiates between your scapulae, and you're going to have hilar lymph adenopathy. That's the big thing, hilar lymph adenopathy with pulmonary infiltrates, okay? Secondary is the reinfection. Now you're going to get um, localization in a cavitary nodule. It's going to be a cavitating nodule, okay? And remember, you're going to have caseating granulomas here, caseating granulomas. That's almost pathognomonic for these things. And TB can definitely progress to POTS disease, which is when it goes and disseminates and gets inside your vertebral bodies, okay? Complex, complex is primary, all right? KCA and gran, gran, uh, granulomas is going to be secondary in the cavities, okay? Uh, the avium, like I said, is going to be for people with AIDS that have less than 50 CD4 count. You can also, um, let's see, I think that's probably going to be it. We'll get into all of the the different uh, drugs when we go to drugs, but just know for right now, you can treat with RIPES. That's going to be your mnemonic for that, which is rifamycin, isoniazid, um, the pywin, um, and then you're also going to have ethambutol, and you're going to have streptomycin. So just keep that on the shelf in your brain. Let's go over here to lepra, leprae, which is leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, okay? And so with leprosy, you're going to have the tuberculoid form, okay, and that's going to affect your TH1s, or you can have your lepromatous form of leprosy, that's going to affect your TH2s, all right? So with your tuberculoid form, you're going to have hypopigmented and skin, uh, skin macules that pop up or plaques, and it's going to have enlarged peripheral nerves, And but when you get to lepromatous form, then you're actually going to have skin nodules and raised plaques that disfigure the face, leading to leonine faces, which makes them look like a lion, okay? And that's going to be pretty much your big things with that. Remember, this is going to be acid fast for testing because all these are mycobacteriums that we're talking about, so they're going to be acid fast for testing. All right, let's go on to chlamydia. Remember, we tell you before, chlamydia is going to have a clear discharge associated with it. Not only is it going to have that, it's going to have trachoma. And so trachoma is actually going to turn your eyelids inside out somewhat and have a discharge. So you'll get that a lot with, with neonates. And you can do iodine staining for this one. You can also get uh, LGV with this, which is lymphogranuloma venereum. All right, so check that out when you get a chance. And um, you can get infant pneumonia. Uh, this can cause PID, epididymitis, Ryder syndrome, or conjunctivitis, Ryder syndrome, re and reactive arthritis. That's the one. The mnemonic for that is you can't pee, can't see, can't climb a tree. All right, those are going to help you remember what that affects. You can get this by your finger touching your eye. If you scratch down there and you're infected with chlamydia, you dirty dog. I'm just kidding. Not dirty dog because you have chlamydia because that can happen. Um, I wouldn't know, but I'm just saying, but I'm saying like because you scratched and didn't wash your hands. Just wanted to clear that up. Anyway, you can get it through passage at birth. You can get it through sex. This is intracellular. All right. And uh, let's talk about the life cycle of chlamydia. So basically, you're going to have a cell, right? And you're going to have chlamydia. It's going to come. It's going to latch on as a reticulate body. Um, and I mean, excuse me, it's an elementary body. It's going to get inside. Now it's inside. It's going to transform to a reticulate body. Reticulate bodies are the, the form that replicates. As it starts replicating, it gets very numerous, and then it's going to pop out of the cell, and it's going to actually burst forth the cell. And now you have a lot of them that have come out as reticular bodies that retransform into elementary bodies now, and you start to process over as it goes and lashes on as an elementary body. So just know the replicating body form is the reticular body. Okay, so now let's talk about um, chlamydophilia pneumonia, which is not, it's chlamydophilia, it's usually categorized with chlamydia, it causes pneumonia, okay, it's an obligate intracellular as well, and then finally, rickettsia, rickettsia, you have the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, I've talked about that, it's mostly so, uh, localized to the southeast USA, like Tennessee, the Carolinas, something like that, it's the Demercantor tick, the uh, D. andersoni, you can look it up as that, known as the dog tick, commonly, um, 
it can stain with GMSA, and it has the wheel felix test. It's positive for that one. That's W E I L F E L I X, and you'll get petechiae on the palms and the soles. It spreads from the wrists and ankles to the trunk, and the drug of choice is doxycycline, and that will complete this one for atypical bacteria.